Thousands of Japanese are bracing themselves as Typhoon Guchol has again made a landfall in eastern Japan on Tuesday evening. It's dumping torrential rain across many coastal areas. Guchol is the first typhoon in eight years to directly hit Japan's main island of Honshu during the month of June. Experts at Japan's meteorological agency say the storm is now heading toward northeast Honshu. Government officials in western Japan have ordered the evacuation of 1,500 people for fear of mudslides. Evacuation advisories have been issued to over 120,000 people. In northeastern Japan, coastal areas are on alert for high waves. Local officials in Ishinomaki City and Miyagi Prefecture advised 10,000 residents to evacuate. The ground level at, of Ishinomaki subsided after last year's March 11th earthquake, making it more vulnerable to high waves. Also in Miyagi Prefecture, officials in Kesenuma City issued evacuation advisories for possible floods affecting 5,000 people. The storm has disrupted transportation networks across uh, Japan. Airlines have canceled more than 450 domestic flights. The 42 international flights have also been grounded. Japan's science minister says the government will review last year's decision to withhold reliable data on the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. Hirofumi Hirano is trying to figure out why officials kept radiation maps provided by the United States under wraps. The U.S. Department of Energy maps were based on aerial surveys taken immediately after the Fukushima accident. They showed high levels of radiation in areas to the northwest of the facility. U.S. authorities sent the maps to Japan on March 18th and 20th last year. But officials at the Science Ministry and Japan's Nuclear Safety Agency didn't make them public. Hirano is defending how staff at the Science Ministry handled the matter. He says their job was only to measure radiation levels on land. Very near you can see the brain scrambler, Vic. But he's urging the government to rethink its decision not to share the map information and put it to use. He also says government officials will continue to study whether making the maps public could have helped with evacuation efforts. What's <laughs> so funny now? I sometimes just think funny things. A new Japanese government report highlights shortcomings in science and technology surrounding the March 11 disaster. The latest white paper on science and technology says the public was not ad adequately informed about the spread of radioactive substances from the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The report says tsunami estimates were too lenient. It adds that existing facilities were insufficient for ensuring safety at the plant. The document also recommends that the government establish ways to systematically incorporate the opinions of science and technology experts. It says this must be done quickly in order to restore the public's trust. <laughs> Kevin Camps is the nuclear waste watchdog at beyondnuclear.org. Kevin, welcome back to our program. Hi, Tom. Great to have you with us. Uh, before we get to San Onofre, uh, please tell me, what, the last time we talked, you were telling us the tuna that we're starting to catch off the coast of California, or off the coast of the west coast of the United States and Mexico, is uh, contaminated with radioactive cesium. What is the situation right now with our, with our food supply, with our seafood supply? Well, that's anybody's guess because the U.S. federal government is not doing its job. It's not checking it carefully. So, uh, you know, a lot of concerned citizens have now taken matters into their own hands. They're purchasing the necessary equipment to check their food. That's happening in Japan. It needs to happen in the U.S. Is there any kind of organized group in the United States that is, I mean, like I bought, you know, I bought a Geiger counter a couple of months ago. I, if, if there was a, a group that I could hook into, I would say, okay, I'll test things, or I'll walk through the supermarket once a week. Is there anything, or are you guys trying to put something like that together? Yeah, actually, uh, Cindy Folkers at our organization, who is our radiation and health expert, is talking with folks uh, mostly on the West Coast, but really this should be happening other places. So 
Cindy's our point person on that issue. Okay, good. So people can learn about that over at beyondnuclear.org. So uh, there's this nuclear power plant at San Onofre. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, San Onofre. Okay, so tell me the story. Well, uh, January 31st, and, you know, you got the scoop. You had me on your show that night about this. Uh, the San Onofre unit number three sprung a leak in a steam generator tube, and that is always very significant because if you were to fail enough tubes, you could have a loss of coolant accident in the reactor core. Fortunately, they only failed one tube, but it was the beginning of a long story. When they investigated the state of the tubes, there was significant degradation of these tubes, and these tubes in Unit 2 and Unit 3 have only been in service for about a year or two. These are brand new replacement steam generators purchased from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Japan at a cost of $670 million, and they're failing a year or two into their service life. They're supposed to last for 30 years. So why are they failing? It turns out, and this just happened last night, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission held a public, uh, it's called an augmented inspection team exit meeting. They were talking to Southern California Edison, but the public can sit in the room and then ask mm -hmm. NRC questions afterwards turns out that Mitsubishi Heavy Industries computer modeling was completely out of whack and the, the steam generators were designed wrong to begin with. So the uh, computer model estimated a certain flow rate for the steam through these uh, steam generator tubes. It was about a fourth of the actual value. So the tubes uh, have suffered significant vibration. They've rubbed against each other and against surrounding support structures and they've been uh, highly degraded. And actually, Friends of the Earth hired Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. They called this out months ago. They identified the problem, uh, I think it was back in March. Before the NRC had identified it. Long before. And the NRC, you know, plays a lot of games. They try to uh, keep things hidden for as long as possible, and they're just under too much of a spotlight. Right. So the NRC is making some pretty remarkable admissions. Last night they admitted that they've never seen anything like this before. There may be fines against Southern California Edison. A big question is, are they going to have to replace these things if they want to keep operating this plant? That would be putting the price tag over a billion dollars to try to get this right, and it's right. the ratepayers paying that. So I'm assuming that Southern California Edison is coming forward and saying, we're not crazy, we're not going to restart this nuclear plant with, with uh, steam turbines that, that, if they fail, could cause a meltdown of the core and are failing at the rate of, you know, one, uh, one tube a year, uh, we're not crazy, we're not going to do this, we're going to replace them first. They, they, they must be saying that, right? Not at all. What they're saying is they want to run these things at about half power. They think that if they do that, that the vibration will be decreased, and unfortunately the NRC is going along, saying, yeah, that might work. So, you know, Friends of the Earth and all the grassroots groups are like, no way, this would be a giant nuclear experiment. Isn't half California. power twice what they were designed for? I'm you sorry? You said that they were running four times as much steam through them as they're designed for. So if they're running half power, are they running twice as much steam as they're designed for? Well, when I said uh, four times the steam was flowing through there, as the computer model predicted, that's because of the bad design of these steam generators. Uh -huh. The uh, reactors themselves, they're both about 1,000 megawatts electric. And I'd have to check. I don't know off the top of my head. But most reactors in the U.S. get these rubber stamp power up rates, they're called, where they actually run the reactors hotter and harder than they were ever designed for. So I don't know if that's the case at San Onofre, but Whoa. the problem is the configuration of these steam generator tubes. They're just pumping way too much steam over these very thin-walled tubes. Yeah. So how is this going to shake out, Kevin? This is, uh, you know, there's a growing list of reactors in this country that are very vulnerable to permanent shutdown. You've got San Onofre Units 2 and 3. You've got Fort Calhoun, Nebraska. That's been shut down for 14 months after the historic floods on the Missouri. You've got Vermont Yankee uh, with the state government and the people of Vermont adamantly opposed to its operation. So what's happening is just this uh, rebellion against nuclear power in the U.S., and the grassroots are on it, and they're trying to keep these things shut down before they melt down. Right, but they they tried to do that in Japan, too, and the Japanese government just fired up a nuclear power plant, what, day before yesterday? Yeah, well, it just shows how powerful the nuclear power industry is in Japan, both politically and economically, where they just tell the prime minister what to do when he does. But hopefully there's going to be some popular backlash. I mean, the only reason that all 50 operable reactors in Japan have been shut down for weeks and months is that the, the people 
made it so, you know, the grassroots pressure on governors of prefectures. So, for example, uh, the OE reactors near Osaka City, the mayor of Osaka is anti-nuclear. He's right. very concerned about the safety implications of this restart. So there are politicians with ambition who happen to be anti-nuclear, and this may cost the current prime minister in Japan. That's interesting. What's the state, I know building number four, the last we heard building number four of Fukushima has in its ceiling all this radioactive material and it's listing. Is that still going on? Yes, yeah, we're just, you know, holding our breath against the 7.0 that could just knock the whole thing down and, and that waste would be on fire within an hour or two. Oh. And that would be a catastrophe bigger than what's happened already. And, and, and uh, bigger than Chernobyl. Yeah, by about tenfold. Tenfold, wow. Kevin Camps, beyondnuclear.org. Tokyo police have arrested the head of a Japanese investment advisory firm. They believe the country defrauded clients of millions in pension assets. Police arrested Kazuhiko Asakawa of AIJ Investment Advisors Company and three other people. Police believe the advisors cheated two of their clients last year by showing them false investment records. Asakawa said during sworn testimony in the Diet that he did present false documents to clients, but he denied any intent to deceive them. What's so funny now? Sometimes just think funny things. Police say Asakawa admitted to the charges against him during questioning. Investigators searched AIJ headquarters in Tokyo before making the arrests. Corporate pension fund managers entrusted nearly $2 billion to the company. 
Officials at Japan's securities watchdog say managers at AIJ lost most of that money.